Welcome to Believer's Chapel and the, I don't know, is this the adult Sunday school class? Um, if you're visiting, we welcome you. Uh, we're glad you're here. It was a real treat last week to have Dr. Lilbeck, president of Westminster Theological Seminary, and Dr. Walkie, a world-renowned theologian. Uh, last week, Dr. Walkie preached from Psalm 69, and he spoke on a biblical response of the church and our stance that we are to take in the face of persecution. And uh, what a wonderful encouragement that was, timely um, and fitting for the age in which we're living. This morning, we'll be looking at 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, specifically verses 17 through 25. I think we'll start reading from verse 13. So I'll read from verses 13 through 25. It'll give us kind of a fuller context of this, this chunk, but really we're going to drill in on verses 17, 18, uh, 17 through 21. That will be the focus, but I want us to cover what's before and what's after um, in 1 Peter. Peter is writing to uh, the churches in Asia Minor, um, scattered uh, across Asia Minor, and he's encouraging the church and exhorting them in the same way that, in a similar way that we were exhorted and encouraged last week to a church facing uh, hostility and persecution. This letter would prove to be indispensable to the early church as that increasing hostility grew and intensified later under Nero. Um, this letter has continued to be an encouragement, an indispensable encouragement uh, in bringing a tangible, a tangible hope, experiential strength, hope, and even joy among the saints uh, in the midst of uh, persecution throughout the church age. Um, the most intense persecutions imaginable the texts we're reading today has brought encouragement, joy, and hope to countless saints throughout the age. For example, Corrie ten Boom, as you know, uh, she wrote in one of her letters uh, and mentions her encouragement brought forth from God's word in 1 Peter. She wrote in a letter, when I was in, a con in the concentration camp, a camp where only 20% of the women came out alive, we tried to cheer each other up by saying nothing could be any worse than today, but we would find the next day was even worse. During this time, a Bible verse that I had committed to memory gave me great hope and joy. From 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, or blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, evil is spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And then she writes, I found myself saying, saying, hallelujah, because I am suffering, Jesus is glorified. And so my prayer is that the Lord is glorified in our hour this morning as we come to his word. May we be strengthened in our time in his word together. And with that, let's dive in. I'll read from verse 13 and continue to the, end of the, uh, to the end of the chapter. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One, who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but from, uh, from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, 
as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Verse 20, for he was known before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope in God are in God. Since you are in obedience to the truth, purify your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. This is the indispensable, imperishable, imperishable word of God. Um, While we open in verse 17, verse 13 is a fitting beginning in our reading. Um, It opens with prepare your minds for action. Uh, Peter is encouraging the church, exhorting the saints how to live as those who have been saved, those who have been born again in chapter one, those who are being sanctified in the face of their uh, distress by various trials. The broader text from verse 13 to 25 can be outlined in three parts, showing the Christian life, how to live the Christian life. From verse 13 through 16, Peter exhorts the believers to live a life of holiness. He exhorts, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also for in all, in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So a life of holiness. Number two, from verses 17 through 21, Peter exhorts the believer to live a life of reverence to the Lord, and the fear of the Lord, a life characterized by the fear of the Lord. Conduct yourselves in the fear of the Lord Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. From verses 22 through 25, Peter exhorts the believer to live a life of love for the saints. Fervently love one another from the heart. Three key exhortations to the saints. Three traits that are to be characteristic of us uh, in the church. Of us who are called to a higher calling, called out of the world into a higher kingdom. And as followers of Christ, we would be characterized by holiness, reverence, and love. Verse 17, if you address the Father as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay on earth. As we profess to be followers of Christ, we are called to be holy, uh, set apart, distinct from, a fallen, from the fallen world from which we were called out of. We are to be holy in our behavior. Uh, we are set apart, uh, holy as God is holy and distinct. We've been called out of the fallen world and, in, and placed into the service of the heavenly kingdom in the service to God the Father. And there is to be a clear distinction. Uh, We are holy, distinct, set apart from the world to the service of the Father who is holy. As professing children of God, uh, we are to reflect the Father in our attitudes, our mindsets, our conduct, and our behavior. Ephesians 5.1, Paul writes, Therefore be imitators of God as children as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. As his children, we are to be imitators, reflecting that attribute of God in his holiness, not in and of ourselves, but in Christ. We are set apart, sanctified to his service, 
Uh, we are to be imitators of God. And to be imitators of God, we must know him rightly. And we must grow in him rightly from his word. He is holy. He is righteous. And he is our judge. And he judges rightly, Peter exhorts. He judges impartially um, to each one's work. We are to, and that is how we are to imitate God, to know him rightly. And to know him rightly is to know him as our judge. That's one aspect of who he is. We will all stand before God as judge. And we will give an account. Both those who have trusted in the person and work of Christ, we will stand before him as judge. And those who have rejected Christ, ultimately, will stand before him as judge. Um, but there's a major distinction in what God will judge. We will not be judged according to our sin, but according to God's uh, Christ, the righteousness of Christ. But there will be a val final evaluation of each and every uh, believer for those in, of which, for that which he has entrusted unto us. And our conduct as Christians, as saints in Christ, will be judged. Paul writes of this to the saints in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse verses 12 through 15. This is to believers. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. <clears throat> they will show it because it is to be refined with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as though through fire, yet as through fire. It's 1 Corinthians 3, chapter verses 12 through 15. Knowing this, knowing this reality as saints, we are to conduct ourselves in fear during our stay on earth. He is impartially a judge according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. We are to live our lives as saints uh, in a sense of fear um, and reverence and awe towards God for who he is. Knowing who he is, we are in his presence always. Uh, we live in the presence of God day by day, not a moment are we hidden from him? God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus opened his prayer, hallowed be your name. His name is hallowed. It is to be revered and honored and even feared. The fear of the Lord, as you go through the Proverbs, you know well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Later, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom we can say even in the Christian life, to live rightly. The Christian life is to be lived out. And this fear is a healthy fear. It's not a dread or a terror of God's ultimate wrath to come and final judgment under his wrath. But there is a sense of awe and fear that we are to have as saints, knowing who he is. Not out of fear of dread or terror, but out of reverence and honor for who he is and what he has accomplished in his son. The Christian life is not to be lived flippantly or casually, carelessly. Uh, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. The chief end of man is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. And to glorify him, we must live disciplined lives uh, in fear and reverence to who we are serving and who we are and who we are called to be. We live in his presence moment by moment. And we know that judgment doesn't only come in the end. In the end. We, we see judgment come even today. We, we call it discipline. Um, 
And he disciplines those who he loves. The reality in itself ought to give us pause to reflect. The Lord disciplines those who he loves and corrects um, his children. In fact, that's a, a characteristic uh, attribute, uh, a, a sign that you belong to him, is when you stumble or fall that God would be loving to discipline um, his children, to grow them up. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. As a Christian, this is how we are to conduct ourselves in the, during the time of our stay on earth. It's in the fear of the Lord. That phrase ending in verse 17 highlights two aspects of the earthly life. During the time of your stay on earth. And it shows the importance of living in fear of the Lord in a healthy way, a reverential honor unto him. Our life is, an, is a sacrifice and honor to him, uh, to his glory. In the New International, uh, the New American Standard Bible in which we're, we're reading, the line is translated, during the time of stay on earth. The NIV translates it, Dr. Walkie will like this, I'm sure, uh, as one of the translators of the NIV. He puts it, live out your time as foreigners here on earth in reverent fear. The ESV translates it in this way, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. The King James Version, which many of you have, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. The first aspect of this line highlights our duration on earth. The second aspect, our status on earth. So we see our duration and our, our status, and it highlights all the more necessity to live circumspectly in the Christian life with a heavenly purpose in fear and reverence to God. First, there's a duration in this life. As to the duration of this life, it is brief in light of eternity. Dan preached on this a couple weeks ago from James chapter four. You and I are just a vapor. Our life is a vapor. In verse 24, Peter cites Isaiah 40 verses six through eight. All flesh is, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. In the scope of eternity, our life uh, is less than a drop in an ocean, less than that. The ocean is limited, and our life is but a, a, a blip. It struck me, this, this struck me a bit more personally earlier in this year. Um, two of my grandmothers passed away uh, within a, 11 weeks of each other. Um, they were both zealous in their faith in Christ, and that gives great comfort and joy. Um, and we use that term, passed away. We, that's a common phrase, such and such passed away. One passed away, uh, one of my grandmothers passed away on a Sunday, it was Valentine's Day, at the age of 94. And the other, 11 weeks later, at the age of 92. And standing uh, at their funeral next to their casket, it struck me how quickly 94 and 92 has passed. Time passes away quickly. Unless the Lord returns, each one of us, you and I, we will pass away. Uh, but our passing will be a glorious passing because we will be with Christ, our Savior. Uh, but it will happen in an instant, and we don't know when. Uh, whether it's at age 94 or 49, um, it is a passing moment. And so that realization is important in living the Christian life. Um, we are to live the Christian life in fear of the Lord with ser as a serious uh, 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 consideration of our conduct here on earth. While, life, while God has given us life and breath, this day, each day, we are given 
to live in the presence and the fear and reverent fear and awe and wonder, for he is a good and righteous judge. So we are to conduct ourselves accordingly, knowing this. Second, we see that we are our status here on earth. Um, uh, so our status on earth, we are sojourners. Uh, we are foreigners. Peter earlier called uh, the saints that he's writing to the churches aliens. Uh, one who is in exile. As followers of Christ, the reality is this world is not our home. In the, this world, we are not to make our home. Um, I really liked what Dr. Walkie said last week in this line. He said something to the effect of, we are in the world, but not to be of the world, to testify to the world of the one who overcame the world. This fallen world is not our home. We must be reminded of that because the pool, the pool we, we, are, we are deceived into buying into is that this is, this, is the, this is our home. It's not our home. Our citizenship is not here. Uh, we are in the world, but by grace, by God's sovereign grace, our citizenship is in heaven. We are of heavenly we are heavenly citizens. And when we look at the world in which we lived, um, it is being reserved. We can see it. When we look at it from the scope of Scripture, we see the world, and it is reserved for judgment. We have been witnessing it in our own society for decades. This downward spiral where evil is now celebrated as good. And that which is good and right is the right denigrated and mocked. This in itself is in the presence, we, we live in the presence of God's judgment in a sense. That God would hand, hand over the world to the lusts of their own flesh and the desires of their heart, for they do not desire him. Uh, for they are, the world is at enmity with him. And we are to have no part, we are to part, we are to take part in none of the affections of the, towards the world within our minds and our conduct. The fear of the Lord keeps us from these deceitful enticements. As followers of Christ, we recognize that we are fo foreigners. You are foreigners in this world. I am a foreigner in this world and in this country. Ultimately, we have no roots here, no roots. Our roots are planted with Christ in heavenly places. Paul exhorts the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter uh, 3, verse 18 through uh, 20. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross. These are not saints, but those who may have once proclaimed to be part of the church but have proven themselves as, as ones of the world. They are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on things, on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 3 of verse 1, Peter points to the saints, to who they are in Christ and what they have in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The inspired writer of the Hebrews connected this well in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service and reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. There is a kingdom awaiting us in glory. 
by his grace. And this reality of those who are in Christ, your citizenship is in, he in heaven. Our inheritance is in Christ. And that inheritance is imperishable. And all that which is attained for us in that state is, came at a great cost. Um, it was a gift, a free gift, but it came at a great price. Verses 18 through 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your fathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. This word redeemed, the concept of redemption, to be redeemed, to have a redeemer, uh, the redemptive plan of God through the ages, uh, is central to the gospel. It's fundamental to the study of salvation, of who we are. You almost can't speak of salvation in Christ without speaking of the redemptive price. We are redeemed. The word here is the idea is to be purchased. We are purchased out of. We are purchased out of the world. We are purchased out of the slave market of sin. We are redeemed. You have been bought with a price. And the price is the precious blood of Christ. The imperishable, uh, the lamb unblemished. The unblemished, spotless, imperishable blood of the lamb. For one to be redeemed, there must be a redeemer. There must be one that pays the purchase. And there's a price tag for that purchase. And the idea here is a payment uh, of ransom or a payment price as a ransom out of slavery or out of imprisonment. And that's the condition. That was our condition. That is the condition of every, every man. The condition of fallen natural man. And each one of us were born in this state. Out of the womb, uh, Charles Wesley wrote, uh, um, bound in sin and nature's night. That's what characterized us. We were bound in sin, enslaved in it. And there is no ability in and of ourselves of those who are born in Adam to take even the slightest step uh, in a Godward direction. That is our inability, our total inability. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 8, Paul writes, But natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness of him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. That's what characterized me. That's what characterized you who are in Christ. We recognize that. We were redeemed. That is from which... That is from which we were purchased and redeemed from. Uh, in slavery to sin and nature's night, utter darkness, and now called as children in the light, that we would walk in the light. The spiritual condition of man is illustrated by the spiritual, by the physical condition of God's people in Egypt. And Peter here is referencing, alluding to that by pointing to the lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. It was approximately 300 years after Genesis chapter 50. In Exodus, we find the descendants of Jacob or Israel enslaved uh, to the Egyptians. In Exodus chapter 12, we, we know the story. Um, the Lord, caught, God causes Moses to go to Pharaoh time and time again, uh, let, my let uh, God's word, let my people go. In Exodus chapter 12, we see in the last plague, God's command to Moses to instruct the people to take a spotless lamb, an unblemished lamb. It is written to slay the lamb, to cover the doorposts with blood, the doorpost and the lintel. Um, the blood of the unblemished land was to cover the household so that when the angel of the Lord were to pass over, they would pass over 
that house, and that house would be spared from death, death of the firstborn. They were commanded to take the lamb, to slay the lamb, to roast the lamb, and to eat the lamb with bitter herbs. It's a picture of Christ, and that picture was, grant, was given to Israel, to God's people, uh, and, and um, in, installed in the Passover, um, observed each year. In the night, the angel of the Lord would pass over each home that was covered in the blood of the lamb. And the angel of the Lord would then slay the firstborn. Death would come to the home that was not covered in the blood of the lamb. Both man and beast, uh, any of the home that was not covered in the blood of the lamb. The memorial of this redemption uh, was instituted in the Passover meal. Each year, year over year, the blood of the lamb was the point. Israel was to point Israel to the Redeemer uh, who would ultimately come and fulfill the covenant. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, we see, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of your sins year over year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not uh, desired, but a body you have prepared for me. The blood of the lamb was to point Israel to the true substance, not the lamb, but the lamb of God, which would come into the world as the God man would descend, as God would descend, as God the Son would descend and take on flesh. And you'll remember in his early ministry, John the Baptist declared, behold, the, the Lamb of God, um, which takes away the sins of the world. And here Peter is referring to that feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. Ultimately, the physical blood and the physical lamb was a feudal attempt. In, in that itself, there is no redemption. The substance was in Christ, the Redeemer. Isaiah would speak of the Redeemer all throughout Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 59, verse 19 through 20. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. A redeemer will come to Zion, and those who turn from transgression in Jacob declares the Lord. The redeemer throughout Isaiah is the redeemer. The redeemer of Isaiah is the uh, suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53. He himself was the price for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, the she like a sheep that is silent, before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. This Messiah would come to redeem his people, willingly, obediently, laying down his life for his sheep, shedding his own blood for his elect children, uh, without any utterance of protest. It was a willing sacrifice in which the Redeemer laid down his life. He would come to redeem his people from their sins by willingly laying down his life, by shedding his own blood. Our sins before a righteous and holy God required a perfect payment, um, a blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And a sinless substitute was required to pay that redemptive price. Uh, the wages of sin is death. And only death uh, would satisfy God's righteous demands. Uh, the perfect sacrifice, the sinless sacrifice, sacrifice of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, which is Christ Jesus himself. He would sacrifice his own son. That is the love of the Father for the saints displayed in his son. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
This was the payment, the redemptive payment, the redemptive price paid in full in the person and work of Jesus Christ himself. Fully man, yet without sin. Only man can atone for the sins of man, but only the perfect man, only the God man. He would lay his life to satisfy God's justice for his people. The redemptive price was his own blood. And that payment was sufficient, fully sufficient, offered one time for all. Um, all in the sense of it is finished for all time. <clears throat> there is no more need to repeat that sacrifice. It is completed. We remember that in the Lord's Supper. And as we go through these uh, two hours, we build up to that uh, the, 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 the focus of our day at, at the table of our Lord in which we remember the sacrifice of our, our Lord, his body and the, the, the wine signifying his blood. The elements are not his body and the blood because it's already been paid. There's no need for him to offer again. It has already been offered and satisfied. That was the payment, the redemptive price, paid in full, fully man, yet without sin, laid down his life to fully satisfy God's justice. And there is none for whom the payment was made that is lost, nor will be lost or can be lost. It is, his payment was fully effectual for all his elect, all who put his trust, their trust and faith upon the person and work of Christ. It doesn't get more personal than that. We're not speaking of these things in some theoretical uh, exercise for the sake of uh, our minds. Um, it is experiential. The work of Christ for you and for me is deeply personal. He experienced the suffering, the full wrath of God, that we would be made children of him. Death and sin was swallowed up in that redemptive price of Jesus' sacrifice for his people. And that is what he longed to do. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus Christ uttered no protest. He willingly laid down his life as a ransom for many. That was his very mission before the foundation of the world. We see that here in verses 20 through 21. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Christ the Son, the Son of God, was foreknown before the foundation of the world. I love how Dan put it um, in speaking about the foreknowledge of God. Well, of course he foreknew the Son for they were one. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are one. So this foreknowledge of God is not, not just a, a, a knowing like I know you, um, uh, but the foreknowledge of God was much more than that. Christ the Son is foreloved, of course. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one. There is a love that exists within the Trinity that we will never fully comprehend. Um, before the foundation of the world, the Son was foreloved. But it goes deeper than that. He was forepurposed, foreordained. Um, for purposed before the foundation of the world, the mission of God was set in eternity past before the foundation of the world. Peter speaks of this in the day of Pentecost at the day of Pentecost back in Acts chapter two. The large crowd is there. You know, the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. It's really interesting because the letter in which he's writing, there are members of Asia Minor, they're citizens of Asia Minor who have come down um, 
specifically from Cappa Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygera, Pamphylia. Uh, Pamphylia. Uh, there were members in that community who would later that this letter would be sent to. And he, he stands up and he teaches in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. We see that here in the text. He is raised from the dead and is given glory. And all that mission of God was pre-planned. That was the foredetermined plan for Christ and agreed upon in Christ. Before the foundation of the world, he was foreordained or forepurposed to endure the cross. <clears throat> that too is characteristic of the saints in Christ who were foreknown in him. We were foreknown in him, we were foreloved in him, and we were foreordained or forepurposed in Christ. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he writes to those res reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and those according, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled in his blood. 2 Timothy 1.9-10, he has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was granted in us, in Christ Jesus, from all eternity. We know Romans 8.28, for those who he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of of God. We were foreloved and foreordained for purpose um, in Christ to be conformed in his image. It was, and we, have, or we're, we are raised up in him. From, uh, and, and this is Christ who was raised up from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The seal of God's full approval that his sacrifice, the it is finished, was determined or set upon Christ as a seal in his resurrection. We heard, we've heard it said that the Father's, the resurrection of Christ is God the Father's amen to God the Son's it is finished. Uh, and we see that uh, here in the resurrection from the dead. And he has given him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Uh, to close, I'd like to turn to Revelation. We see this. Um, he is revealed, he is foreknown for the, before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in the last times for your sake. Through him, all our believers who, are raised, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Turn with me to Revelation chapter five. Verses 6 through 14, I'll read and then close. But this text, I think, encapsulates everything we've studied in this hour that we've seen in 1 Peter. He has been revealed to us in faith. There will be a day where he will be revealed to us in sight. Revelation chapter 5 speaks of this. And I saw between, verse 6, I saw uh, between the throne with four living creatures and the elders of the land standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came back and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, 
which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor, to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worship. Well, as we sojourn in this life, May we reflect on this uh, and by God's grace live uh, in a way that displays his glory and honor in the conduct of our lives. It is by his grace we are his. It is all by grace. If we do not know Christ, look to him. Uh, escape the wrath of God to come and the only escape is found in his son. And if you are in Christ, that is by God's grace, we remember the lamb that was slain. May we live and conduct ourselves um, in honor and glory to him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for uh, your word, the unblemished word of God. Two things in this room will go on for eternity, uh, the souls of men and your enduring word. And by your grace, we are redeemed in your son. And in your son is displayed your deep and everlasting love for us, undeserving and yet poured out in the person and work of your son in whom is our, our hope in our glory and we await his coming day um, and we pray that he would come quickly in our midst and whether we depart and go to you or you come to us we know we are secured in the strength of your son and the purchase that was paid we give thanks for you in jesus name amen